So I think, I mean, simplistically, there's probably three sort of styles of play, 4-4-2, 4 4 3 and, and within those, those different formations, there's, there's other particular ways that you can play them. So, and, and I'm probably, you know, obviously we kind of all know these. So uh, the, the 4 4 2, what I would call the orthodox 4 4 2, British style 4 4 2, if you, you want to say that. Um, for me, the, the, the advantages of, uh, of the system is it's, it's, it's simpler to set up. Players' roles are, are kind of quite defined. Um, defensively, your structure is, is good. Um, it's more a, probably a rather than a player um, man to man kind of setup it's a it's a, a zone kind of setup and and it gives you a good solid structural base so if you're starting with somewhere with a team and wanted to keep things simplistic or you didn't have much time with the team it's a kind of system that I think you can set up and and put in practice sort of uh, quite quickly <clears throat> Then, then you've got the, the the diamond system where you have. Um, I'll probably use number. I'm I'm kind of. I, I don't like to say the word old school, but I've, I'm one of those guys that's kind of been reluctantly dragged into the 21st century um, using numbers instead of positions. Um, so with the the diamond shape, the, um, the the kind of advantage you, you get from that is you've obviously got two strikers, so you get you get two players um, in advanced positions rather than if you've got three up there and they, they can kind of get isolated. And you've got a number 10 who, who's, supporting, who's supporting that role. And then you can always often get an, an overload in midfield and you tend to have your midfield players in, in good connections with each other. Some of the, the, the and then obviously it's a, a system where if you've got some attacking fullbacks, you, they've got that space wide and they're the players that will probably give you give you width in that, in that system. Um, some of the challenges is that the, the number 10 role is, is a, an important role in that system, how you want them to play, what kind of player that is, um, what kind of freedom you give that player, and then how do you set up structurally? So uh, your, your challenge can be, from a defensive perspective, that your left and your right-hand side midfield players may have to cover a lot of ground because they are the players that's perhaps going to have to get out wide to pick up fullbacks who are going forward unless you then in a defensive setup uh, change the system between with your number 10 and your two strikers where you might actually float that into a um, into a three up front and press from there so that's kind of some of the little bits and pieces of my my thoughts on on that system <clears throat> And then just another variation, you might play as a 4-1-4-1. Four, one, four, one. So it's slightly more, I don't know if you could say more defensively minded, but I think that the, the important um, relationship often in that, that system is uh, the player that plays in front of your back four. So depending on the qualities of that player, that allows your, maybe your full backs to go forward more, allows your midfield players, particularly your two central midfield players in front, to be a little bit more adventurous. So, so you can end up perhaps uh, defending with a four, the back four and the front sweeper, and then attacking with your other midfield four and, and your striker. And, and again, I think the key thing with that is that making sure that your striker doesn't just uh, stay, stay, at, stay isolated and that uh, those players... Uh, midfield really need to get forward and support them. Okay, and the box system. Um, interesting system. It's uh, North Carolina in the W uh, NWSL <laughs> played this system very effectively, uh, but they've got a team of great athletes. Like they get team a team where the two fullbacks can run all day, the four midfield players can run all day, and the strikers are like whippets. Um, Greyhounds. I don't know if you've got whippets. In a, whippets is very, a very British expression, meaning uh, people that can run fast. And um, so they, they, that system, uh, the advantage of that system was when you play against it, you often get overloaded in midfield and, it, and it's difficult to know how structurally, how you're going to actually pick up or who's going to pick up who. So if you push on and you press the, the 
say the two defensive midfield players, often those two attacking midfield players get into areas where it becomes difficult for back four players to push in and pick them up. Um, the two strikers, depending on how you play your two attacking midfield players and your two strikers, what will often happen is your two strikers will play a little bit wider. So they'll kind of play in between the full backs and the centre backs, which again put them in positions that become or can become a little bit difficult to, to pick them up. Um, and then, as I say, those two attacking midfield players, uh, get, they get into positions as well where, depending on how you set up structurally from a defensive perspective, it can be difficult to pick them up. And the other advantage is that your midfield players, again, are, are often in touch with each other. If you go back um, a little bit in, in history, the Colombia had a fantastic team from the, the beginning of the 90s up to the mid-90s, uh, with a guy called Valderrama with the big hair, for those that are old, you know, for those that are older in my age on the call, big hair. And they kind of played this system. They played a 4-2-2-2. Um, they, had, they had a fantastic team. And they had two really disciplined central midfield players and two centre halves. So they had a block of four defenders there that kind of always, were always behind the ball and always in defensive positions. And that allowed the two attacking midfield players to attack and, and play creatively, but it also allowed pullbacks to get forward. And, um, and they were really, really effective in, in playing that system. But uh, as I say, so it's got some pros that the cons become again from a defensive perspective because your midfield players essentially are, are all playing centrally. So the, the space where you can be, be exploited from a defensive perspective uh, are this, are, is the width where your fullbacks can get a little bit isolated and potentially get a little bit overloaded because your midfield players can't keep getting out to close it down wide. Okay. Tom, if you don't mind, I'm just going to interrupt. So, coaches. Four free threes. Yeah. Oh. Coaches, please. Uh, oh, no, don't. Please do. Yeah, co coaches, at any point, if you if there's something that Tom says or you want to talk about later on or, or chat or anything, feel free to use the chat to to, uh, to say anything. And, and again, if you know of a team that played this particular system or you know, a highlight like Tom, uh, I remember Brazil back in the late 70s playing that box midfield. That, that was really well. So, but, but sorry to interrupt. Go ahead, Tom. So 4 3 3 is probably um, the modern day standard system that, that most, that might be a slight exaggeration, that most teams play to some degree. Um, again, the, 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 the sort of generic ways of, of playing that, uh, the, the back four tends to stay the same. You either play with two sitting midfield players and one attacking and three forwards, or, or you play the opposite. You know, this one here gives you a little bit more um, the, with the two sitting players a little bit more uh, solidified de defensively. It gives your full backs a little bit more cover because your, your two central midfield players can get, a, you know, a bit easier to get across the field rather than have, have one there. Again, the, the, some of the, the general issues that you can have with a 4-3-3 system is that you're your forwards can get isolated. So in the system with the, the two sitting midfield players, the number 10 becomes really important because he's, he or she is a player that really supports and has got to get close to your number nine um, and, and also have the capability of actually maybe getting past the strikers and being one of those players that arrives late in the box. You know, from a female perspective, somebody like Carly Lloyd is ideally suited to that role because... She's a, you know, not just a terrific player, but she's got a great ability to either get in the box late or to make runs past strikers into areas where it becomes difficult for her to be, to be picked up. So again, that relationship between the, the centre forward and the number 10 and the number 10 role in the, that system becomes a, a really, really critical role. And the other way is depending how you play with your number seven and number 11, whether you, depends what kind of players you've got. If you've got two out and out wingers, you might stretch them and play them on the touch lines. If, if they're a bit more, uh, a bit slightly different kind of players and more a mix between a centre forward and a winger, 
that are a little bit more mobile. You might play them a little bit more more infield and encourage your full backs to get forward to, to give you a little bit more width. Uh, again, the challenge with, not the challenge with this system, but the thing you need to think about a little bit more with that system is how do you defend? Because do you then pull your number 10 back and go like straight across the field as a three in midfield? Um, do you drop your two wingers back and, and go like a 4-2-3-1? So you've got to sort of work out what the best thing to do. Because often, um, throw in an old cliche, the, the number 10 in this uh, system can be, can't become a degree of a luxury player because they don't necessarily do an awful lot defensively. So you have to be careful or you have to be, you have to know what the role is of that player, or what you want them to do, particularly from a defensive perspective. So that, for me, um, that player is a key player in, in, that, in that particular way of playing the system. Um, for the 4-3-3, the, what I'd call an orthodox 4-3-3, where you have one sitting player and two uh, attacking midfield players. I think that is structurally a good system to play because I think it gets players naturally in, at good angles and in good supporting positions. So when you're, when you're coaching and you're, you're coaching about support play, uh, it's what, talking about passing on angles, uh, you're talking about getting outside people, you're talking about getting square with people, etc. I think it's a good system to learn how to play in first and foremost. Um, and it, and it's um, from a defensive perspective, it becomes structurally a little bit easier to coach. So you can either pull your two wingers back and almost go like a five in midfield, or you can push on and, and press high with your, your three strikers and your two attacking midfield players. And then you still have your, your front sweeper, if you like, and your back four in place. So that, that's for me, and, and it also naturally gives you a, an attacking five and a defensive five. So from a structural perspective, um, that's for me a, a good system to, if, if you're concerned about how we think we should play, for me that kind of covers a lot of bases to, as a start out. So the orthodox 4-4-2 and what I would call an orthodox 4-3-3 are good start out systems um, if you're sort of getting your team together. And you, and you just want to have a, a base of, or a foundation of systems to start from. And then, then it can go into more like a, a four five one. So again, uh, probably a little bit more defensive, probably not dissimilar to uh, a four one four one. So there's always these little, little tweaks and it's probably a, um, a kind of system that gives you a little bit of four three three but maybe a system of you're playing against a, a better team that's a, a little bit more defensive oriented and gives you a real solid block of five across midfield. And then, oh, you're going back. Oh no, sorry, I haven't gone back. Uh, yep, yeah, I'm good. Okay. Uh, and then there's um, variations of uh, three, five, two. Uh, there's a uh, three, four, three and um, Again, just, just my opinion, I think if you're playing a 3-4-3 like it's up there, you need to be a really good team. <laughs> uh, it, you know, you've got three attackers, you, your width would come from your, your two wide midfield players. Uh, your, your three strikers, the advantage you've got is your three strikers would uh, keep in touch with each other. You'd have your two wide, and I would, your two wide strikers play in field a little bit, probably certainly no wider than the width of the box. So they're in, they're in, in more, more advanced roles. So you're almost playing like a, a three up front. Uh, it, really important that your two central midfield players are, are players who are either switching platforms or certainly defensive minded and tend to support from behind the ball. Uh, it's a system that lends itself to being, uh, if you're chasing the game, a little bit more direct. So if the ball goes to say the the wide player on the right, that you've already automatically got two to three players in the box and in attacking position. So it might be some a, a system you would use when you're chasing the game uh, and you need to start being a little bit more direct with, with how you play. 
And then it also puts what you need in that system of three really good defenders because they can often end up being being isolated and, and covering the ground that you would normally cover with a, a back four. So it can be an effective system, but um, if you're looking at using it, I think constantly um, I th I, you need to have sort of pretty good players, I, in my opinion. And then the... Um, Three, four, one, two, and can you put the other one up there? Because they're they're kind of similar, I think. You know, both of them, yeah. And then three, four, two, one. Again, fairly orthodox. I think the, the key thing in in these systems, the critical thing when you're thinking about these systems, um, are your wing backs, uh, because I, I I don't know, I've done it myself in the past. Is that you, depending on how you want to play that role depends on whether it's, it's better to have someone who's more like a winger or someone who's more like a fullback. Ideally, what you need is a mix of both of those players. That, that's the ideal position. So you need someone who's a very good athlete because they've got to cover a lot of ground. Uh, you've got to have somebody that's, that wants to attack and is prepared to attack and, and capable of attacking, but also disciplined enough to do the defensive positions. Um, so it's a little bit more complex than an, a general, a fullback. Because normally you have a fullback and a wide player, and obviously by the nature of the name of the role, it's a mix of those roles. So it can be a little bit more complex. And that player needs to know when they go forward, when they come back, how wide you want them to go. Um, Chelsea under Conte, played that system, they played a back three, they sat with two in midfield, and they played the two wing backs wide and, and pushed them forward, so they really stretched the field. Now, if you're a team like Chelsea, you can probably do that. If you're a team at the bottom of the Premier League, you probably can't do that. Those two, if you're playing with wing backs, they're probably going to be in field a little bit, and probably a little bit deeper. Um, and then your two midfield players sitting deep. And then Chelsea then had um, uh, Hazard, and I forget who else, who would come in, play infield, and would come deep and pick up the ball. And then they had the Spanish striker who just played on the back line all the time. So that, that's how they played the system, but they had a very good team. So, so some of the keys in the, the three five two variation is that as I say, those two wing back roles become become really important. And again, you often end up with a five and five situation. Your three wing centre backs and your two central midfield players give you that de defensive um, strength and that defensive balance. Um, the the final system, the three four or three four two one, is kind of what we play with New Zealand at the moment. Um, and when we play international games in New Zealand, every game's difficult for us. So we need to have a really good defensive structure. So we play this system because we've got three good centre-backs. Um, they don't go forward. We've got two good sitting midfield players. And then what we do is when we're attacking the ball side uh, wing-back, we want to be really aggressive and going forward. The opposite side wing-back, we want to tuck in field and stay what I'd call a certain amber position. So kind of level with the ball and hedging the bet so that if it looks like we're going to lose it, they're in a good defensive position. If it looks like we can go forward, they're in a good attacking position in field and closer to the strikers and closer to getting in the box. From a defensive perspective, from another attacking perspective, we never want a centre forward to come back and get involved in the game. Her job is always, when I say always, I never mean always, <laughs> but when I say always, her job is, is always to try and break in behind the line. And then our two number 10s, um, their job when we get the ball again is to get forward first, to start to stretch the opposition so we get more players in, in, in forward roles and then start to play from there. So that's kind of how we play it. From a defensive perspective, we set it up similar to what is there. Um, we try and shut off the middle areas and show teams sort of outside of us and, and wide and try and keep the centre really tight. So that's kind of how we play 
that system. So that's kind of just a little ramblings on systems. You could go into a lot of them in a lot more detail and depth and, and different coaches will play them differently. And that will depend on off and on players and who you're playing against. So what I wanted to move on to <clears throat> is, you know, genetically, and I, and I say generically because nobody's um, one thing or comp usually completely one thing or the other, but generically coaches fall into two categories. Um, one is system-based coach, um, and they're the kind of coaches that tend to get players to adapt to the system. Um, uh, so they might be a coach of saying, uh, and, and who are really uh, comfortable and very, um, very, very good at, at knowing a system and how they want to play it and how they want to play the game. And whether that's 4-4-2, 4-3-3, and they'll say, right, okay, we're getting these players in because they suit the system, or you come in and you're a fullback in my system, this is what you do. And then you get the second kind of coach, which I call player-based coaches. Um, and they are, um, they are uh, coaches that adapt the system to the players. So if you've got... Um, you know, really, if you've got two really good strikers, but you don't have many wide players, then you might say, well, we're, we're playing two up front. Uh, if you've got really, if you get two really good players that sit in midfield and work well together, you're going to play two that sit in midfield. Like us with New Zealand, we have three really strong centre-backs. So we need to try and utilise our best players. So we play with a, a back three because of that. We've got two players who are comfortable as wing backs, so we, we play with wing backs. So the coaches that so coaches fall into that category where you you're looking and you're thinking, okay, this is what I think suits our team best and what works with us, and and that's generally how they, they play. So so some of the characteristics and um, some of the benefits and um, the sort of slightly different between both is. A, that uh, the system-based coaches are, are ones who are very structure-focused um, and often a formula-based approach. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a guy in England called Tony Poulos. And um, he, I don't think he's ever had a team relegated from the Premier League, Tony. And he's the kind of guy that the teams get in when they're in trouble. And he comes in and he sets a structure up. And I'm told he literally, uh, and, and his son actually coaches at um, Inter Miami now in the, the MLS, really good coach, Anthony. But, and he disagrees at times with his dad, how his dad plays. And he's known for being incredibly structured, literally moving players half a yard and saying, no, you don't stand there, you stand here. And, and literally being, a, you're a fullback, this is what you do. You never do this whatever that might be is, you never pass the ball into a centre-back. Don't ever do that, even if the centre-back's got 30 yards of space. So the, 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 the system-based coaches are generally on, on structure and know exactly what they want, know exactly what they want the players to do. Pros of that system, it, it's, there's a simplification about it, and a specificity of roles, and there's this continuity of what you do. So players know, this is what I do, this is my role, this is my job, and this is what I do week in and week out, day in, day out of training. So they become, it, it, it makes it much more simpler for everybody. The cons of that is the games, if the game's going wrong, <laughs> then there becomes an an inability to change because you're so entrenched in that system. This is how we do things. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, we're, we're one nil down here. It's a cup game. It doesn't matter if we lose one nil, two nil, three nil, four nil. You know, we've got to try and win the game. So we need to change. Um, and sometimes when you're, you know, stuck into a set system, the ability to change becomes, becomes difficult. Um, and it also, to a the degree, then starts to restrict your, your creativity and your individual decision-making. Because the reality is, when you walk across that white line, 
the coach can't make decisions for you. You've got to make decisions. You make right ones, wrong ones, etc. And uh, and sometimes if you get too system based, too specific, then you lose that ability to change and that ability to create. There was um, it, when I was coaching in in Australia, the, there was a an Australian cricket coach. Eh, sorry, hockey field hockey coach called Rick Charlesworth, and we had. Um, a meeting of coaches of various uh, uh, different sports and and what he did with with hockey a bit similar similar to what you can do in, in college soccer to a degree uh, hockey obviously it's a smaller field and you can have interchange and he basically field hockey did what I think they started doing ice hockey he had players literally before the game know exactly when they were going to be on the field when they were going to be off the field and how long they were going to be on for. So he literally had a rotation for the 80 minutes that they played the hockey game. And no matter if somebody went on and they scored three goals and they were on fire, they, get, they came off and he had, this, he had that system. So he was a very organised, structurally based coach um, and very successful with it. But once the other team started to understand what they were doing and be able to adjust to it then that system eventually became less and less effective so it's one of the, the dangers when you become too system based moving on then you have <coughs> what I call player based coaches and um, they then their characteristics tend to be more principally based um, on how you put in place the principles of play um, more about your playing style more about philosophy and more about habits so you, you're generally then trying to utilize the talents that you've got in your team um, rather than put the, the talents you've got into a particular structure the, the pros of that is that you have generally greater flexibility your team can be unpredictable um, and it also encourages personal responsibility. So you're actually encouraging decision making. Um, and, uh, and, and with that, I think uh, you're then helping develop the player overall. And, and by, it's like anything, it's like, um, I think football, to degree is a balance between science and art uh, and it's getting that, getting that balance right but it doesn't become a free-for-all but there becomes some structure around it but players within that structure are also allowed a degree of decision making and uh, a system that's player-based allows, allows that and depending on the quality of your players and how you feel as a coach that depends on how much uh, flexibility that you give to, to those players. The cons of this system are that um, your, your instructions can appear to be vague. So some people and some players, it's like anything in life, some people and some players like specificity, they, they like the roles, they like to know this is what you want me to do. And, and if they're put outside that comfort zone, that they're not comfortable and they're not confident to do it. The other thing that, um, that this system can do, it can give a deflection of responsibility. So what I mean by that is that players are always looking for a get out. <laughs> and, really, and when things don't go right, um, they're often looking to, to sort of uh, passion, uh, portion off the blame to someone. So the, the, the challenge with uh, being a player-based coach is that players will come and say, well, I really don't know what my role is. I really don't know what you want me to do. Um, despite the fact that you've given them the guidelines and, and you've probably done it for 10 weeks in a row, um, they, they can often use that as a, an excuse, for want of a better word, if things are not going right, is that, well, I, I didn't get specific enough information. So that, that's the balance you've got. And in reality, most of us as coaches, have you need probably a, some of both of those and depending on what your personality is is depending on what kind of side of the pendulum you come down 
Okay. Now, within all of that, there are factors that, that influence your system of play. And, um, and that there's a variety of those. And, you know, the, the first one of those is that um, it depends on your quality of your team against the quality of the opposition. So if, if your team is not as good as the opposition, then your structure and your system become, become more important because you're playing against players that are better than you. So, so you can't just go out and say, well, this is what we are going to do today. And you'll see that in the Premier League. You'll see in the Premier League when teams particularly come up against Manchester City, very few of them play what they, what they would play against a team that's in the middle of the table or on the bottom of the table. Because they know that if they try and go out and play an expansive game, they're, they're probably going to leave themselves open to the, the lethal weapons that a team like Manchester, Manchester City has. Um, and then also, it, um, it depends on your, your philosophy to, to an extent. So again, if you're a better team, then you can sort of say, well, we're going to play our game today. So, for example, when I coached the, the U.S. women's national team, um, we played like we played. We, we looked at the opposition and we looked at the threats that they had. But in essence, we said, well, this is how we are going to play. And then left it up to the opposition to deal with us. When I'm coaching New Zealand, I have a completely opposite approach because mostly if we're playing top 10, top 15 countries, we know that we're playing teams that are, that are probably a little bit better than us. So we need to get our system and our structure right first and then look at ways that we can win the game. So, so it depends on, on those two factors. Um, and <laughs> it's interesting within that, uh, I, when, I was a, when I was working in, in Australia and had the Matilda's job, I used to do some, um, some scouting for the, the men's national team when I, when I had free time because we're all kind of involved in the same system. And, uh, uh, I, won, I, I was at the Confederations Cup 2005 and I was watching Argentina against Tunisia and um, Tunisia went out against Argentina and they played a 4-4-2, sat deep and obviously just wanted to try and sneak a result. They had to get a result but they obviously had to set up very structurally and make sure they defended well. Anyway, to cut a long story short, Argentina scored in, um, during the first half Tunisia still played um, the, a deep 4-4-2. Argentina, after they were 1-0 up, never even tried to attack. They just kept the ball on the halfway line and just kept possession because they were 1-0 up, didn't need to go anywhere. Half-time, Tunisia needed to come out in a more attacking role. So they immediately came out and they pressured Argentina. Within five minutes, Argentina completely changed how they, how they approached the game. They then had two or three passes and had strikers that made runs in behind and played the ball in behind Tunisia. So, so the, it, was a, it was a real um, uh, education in looking at two different teams, looking at a good team playing against a poorer team and how a poorer team had to set up, then how that poorer team had to then change to try and get back in the game and then how the good team adjusted to that. And um, so all those factors, you know, came in play within that, within that game itself um, and showing how, <laughs> how you have to be able to adapt, but how you have to set up your structure. But then if you go and try and do something different, then uh, you're probably getting exposed somewhere else. Another factor is your preparation time. If you have um, a short preparation time, then you need to get your structure and your system your system right. So, you know, if I look at today's, in the past, particularly in women's football in the past, with national teams, you often get much more access to them. Now as the game has become much more professional, you're really only getting access in, in FIFA windows. So we played at the Algarve Cup recently and, and New Zealand has players everywhere. We've got players in Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Germany, France, Portugal, UK, US, 
and New Zealand. So when we get together, we come from everywhere. We recently played in the Algarve Cup, where the first game was on Wednesday. Some of our players came in from New Zealand on the Sunday. Some came in during the day on the Monday, and some came in on Monday night. So we literally had Tuesday to put a team on the field, look how fit and healthy everybody were, uh, was, um, and work out how we're going to play against Belgium the next day. So you literally had one training session. So you had to, as best you can, set up your structure, your system, your starting team within that. So you, you really, you didn't have much time to do anything else. The more time you get together, then the more you can do with your team, the more you can set up of the way that you actually want to play and the style you want to play, the philosophy that you have around your football, um, because you've got time to, to build that up. You've got time for players to work together. Um, and I would say never, never undervalue the amount of time you just can get players on the field actually playing together and getting on the same page with each other. So the longer you have together, the more you can actually um, bring into play the type of system or this type of style that you want to play. Um, the coach, obviously, and I've kind of gone over that before, the, depending on how you are as a coach, depending on your management style, if you're autocratic and you're the boss and this is how you play and this is what you do, then bump, you go that way about it. If you're more democratic kind of manager, you might have more input um, from your players, more discussion about what you do. And also, again, your football philosophy. Some coaches say, this is how we are going to play, regardless. I don't care if we win, lose, or draw. This is my philosophy. This is what I believe in. And this is what we're going to do. Um, other influencing factors. Are you a competitive coach? Uh, which case you have to be pragmatic because your job depends on results. You have to be result focused and that depends on the club or the organisation that you're with. Um, the reality these days is that in the competitive coaching environment, patience is not one of the great traits that are around there. So um, you, you have to be, at times you really have to be pragmatic. Uh, it's a reality. Um, if, if you want to keep your job. So you might be in an organization or a club that, that completely backs you, supports you and says, right, we realize where you're going. We like what you're doing. We like the style of play. We like all of this. So even if the results are not going, going that well, um, then uh, we're, we're going to stick by you. But then again, you might be in an organization that's very much results focused and it's like, You've just lost three games in a row. You, you, as a coach, then you might need to go out and say, we, we need to change things here. Um, so that's something that you really need to consider. And that's uh, all down to the environment that you're actually coaching in. Then as a developmental coach, which um, you can then, it gives you the opportunity to be more learning focused and you can be more experimental. My philosophy in, in development is that um, you don't want to become too systemized. They, if, if I um, relate to Australia, they brought in a, a, a kind of Dutch system about 14 years ago where everybody played 4-3-3 and, and um, everybody played this kind of particular way and you had kids at 11, 12, 13 saying, when I talk to them, say, what position do you play? I'm a number six, I'm a number two, I'm a number eight, I'm a number 10. I'm, Whatever. No, I'm not. Uh, there's no right or wrong in this. My personal opinion is development. When you're a developmental coach, what you're actually doing first and foremost is, as well as skill development, which is the the core skill and technique, the core. You're also trying to be more learning focused and teach players habits and about how to play the game. So as they get older, they've got a knowledge of playing the game as an, opposed to just the knowledge of being a number six or being a number nine. And the other reason behind that is often um, as a developmental player, if you're the best player in the team, you normally play in a very important position. You're normally the striker 
or you're normally the most important midfield player. If you move on um, in the game and you start to move up into higher levels with greater competition, you might no longer be the best number nine or the best striker in the next group you go to. So the more football skills you've got, the more ability you have to understand and play the game, the better chance you have of being able to go and play in a different position. And if you look at the, the US women's national team, I won't say a percentage, but 90%, <laughs> I won't say a percentage, and then I come out with a percentage. Um, <laughs> it's a typical coach, isn't it? Um, the, probably 90% of them, as young players, played the strikers because they were the best player on the team. You suddenly go into the US national team setup, you're not the best player on the team. So you have someone like Kelly O'Hara, great attacking player, unbelievable attacking player, and she's a fullback. Um, so, the, 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 so I think the key in the development sense for me is to try and give a player as best a knowledge and understanding as possible to play the game so that they can go and play in different positions as they get older. Um, yeah, the score affects you. Uh, sorry, I have these wee notices to remind me of stuff because I, I forget things. Um, the score impacts what you're doing. If, you, if you're in front or you're chasing the game. Um, I was talking to Steve before we came on and we played Norway in the, in the World Cup in 2011. We needed to get a draw to go through to the, the quarterfinals and um, it was one each and then we scored another goal with about five minutes to go. I immediately took off one of our attacking players and I put on a centre back and I told her just to sit in front of the back four not to go forward, just sit in there, win the ball, pass it to somebody. Because we were 2-1 up and that's exactly what we did in the game. I put in a little asterisk there of Netherlands v US, as part of my, I said, I, I caught, I scouted for the men's national teams in, in Australia when I had some free time. So at the 2008 Olympics, the Netherlands were playing the US. Uh, the US had to win the game, Netherlands had to get a draw. Holland, the Netherlands played their, um, uh, their natural 4-3-3. The US played 4-4-2. I can't remember who the US coach was, to be honest, at the time. First half, the Netherlands absolutely slaughtered them because they had the extra player in midfield and the two American players couldn't get close to them. They had two dynamic wingers. They had a really good pass in the centre midfield. He just sprayed the ball here, there and everywhere. Had time on the ball. Anyway, the, the US went in 1-0 down at half-time. They, they kind of held on. At half-time, the coach did a really good job. Basically matched up. Went 4-3-3. Started getting closer. Started to pressurise uh, Holland. And all of a sudden, the game, the game turned itself around. And... Um, uh, US get back and got back in front 2-1 so there was about 15 minutes to go so the Netherlands would play this 4-3-3 style of football they immediately brought on a centre forward who was 6 foot 7 at least they pushed somebody else up front they went to a kind of like 3-4-3 or 4-4-2 system they basically got the ball wide to the full backs and the full backs just launched the ball into the centre for centre forward. They played the most British style of game that Hall, I've ever seen Holland play because they were chasing the game. So within that game, the scoreline changed tactics for both teams within the, the 90 minutes of that, that game. And that's where you need players to be adaptable to be able to do that. Um, and at the end, Holland actually got out of jail, they got a free kick and scored and, uh, and drew two each. But this, the score influenced that game from both teams and at different times during the game. So that's something that you, you need to be aware of. And that's where if you players have got more flexibility and you've given them a better knowledge of playing, if you need to change, that ability to change helps you when the score line is either for you or, or against you. And kind of the final factor is, is injuries. You know, if, if you've got a whole host of injuries and your key players are out and you're filling in holes, 
you often have to change how you play. And, um, and, and that can decide that the system you play, it can decide how you're going to go out there and play. And, um, and it's sort of, uh, particularly if you're results focused and you're, you know, your three best strikers aren't playing, you know, your, your chances are you're going to have to go out and play, play a little bit more defensively because you're, you're unlikely to score goals. So that's kind of my ramblings, uh, ladies and gentlemen.